Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome. So on behalf of the Department of Interpreting and Translation of the University of Bologna and endorsed by the International Network Track, I welcome you to this, to this third lecture of this year's Food for Thought series. My name is Nicoletta Spinolo. I'm a member of the MC2 Lab, which is hosting the lectures this academic year. Uh, so before the, we start, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, remember that all of our lectures will be split into two parts of about 20 minutes each, with five minutes break in between, so that both the audience and the speaker can have a little break. Um, you can ask uh, questions, but uh, please only through the chat uh, at any time during the event, but I will forward them to the speaker by reading them aloud at the end of the second part of the presentation. Uh, also, please start uh, by the, with the way you would like to be addressed and your affiliation. Uh, one more thing, please note that on Teams, when the speaker is sharing the screen, you can choose to uh, visualize the slides by clicking on the shared screen on the application, or you can choose to visualize the speaker by clicking on the speaker's video feed. Um, so today's uh, speaker is Professor Elisabeth Tiselius. She's a professor of interpreting studies at Stockholm University. She is a board member of ESD and sits on IEC's research committee. Uh, her research group, uh, Stockholm Process Research in Interpreting and Translation, focuses on cognitive aspects of interpreting and translation. Uh, Professor Tiselius is an uh, external associate of the MC2 Lab and a member of the International Network Track. Uh, her speech today is titled, What's in a Name? Would that which we call an interpreter by any other name talk as sweet? So, Professor Tiselius, thank you for being here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I would first of all like to thank Ricardo for including me in the seminar series. I am very, very honored and also scared. I'd also like to thank Nicoletta for taking on the task to moderate the session. And uh, uh, just as Nicoletta said, please ask questions and please ask them in the feed and we'll discuss them afterwards. And today I will talk to you about cognition in interpreter in interpreting and how different types of interpreting are researched. I will also present a project that I have been running together with Birgitta England Dimitrova. And the project is funded by the Swedish Research Fund. And I realize I should change my slide. There we are, the Swedish Research Fund. Um, and finally, I will also discuss the fact that uh, when we give different labels to different types of interpreting, that influences a lot, among other things, how they are researched. And in the long run, also many other working conditions for interpreters. But... Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to ask you to support our colleague, Vanessa Enriquez Raido. Vanessa is a senior lecturer in translation studies at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And I think that if you've met her, you'll never forget her. And right now she is facing an absolute nightmare with a life-threatening uh, condition. And you can read more about her through givealittle.co.nz. Uh, there, just go there and search for Vanessa Enriquez Raido and you'll find her and her story. And I do encourage you to help if you can and with what you can. Oops, sorry. No, it's not. Okay. So, I don't know why my slides keep jumping around. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to. Now I'm at my class of today's lecture. So, Today, I will start by looking at different types of interpreting, and I will then go on to do a short overview of uh, cognitive processes and cognition in interpreting. And I will also discuss fundamentals of simultaneous and dialogue interpreting with you. And here, I'd love to have input uh, in the feed, that is. We'll have a short break after that, and then I will... Uh, present uh, the project, the Invisible Process Project, and I will also shortly discuss the impacts of labels and research. 
And this is my collection of pictures of interpreters. Uh, these are all interpreters, uh, but despite the fact that they do more or less the same thing, which I will come back to later, they are all labeled differently. They have different training, if any, and they have different remuneration, if any. Some are defined by the mode they work in, like the simultaneous interpreter in the middle of the slide, or the dialogue interpreter below her. Others are defined by the setting they work in, uh, and today she is also represented uh, in the middle of the slide, the woman in the booth, uh, or the court interpreter at the left hand side, the top left hand side of the slide, the medical interpreter at the top right hand side. They can also be defined by whom they work for, like the military interpreter at the bottom right hand side. And some are also defined by one of their working languages. And in this case, that is, of course, the sign language interpreter at the bottom left hand side. Some are defined as not being interpreters. They are ad hocs or non-professionals or something else. And they are today represented by the little girl interpreting a Christmas song for her deaf parents. Yet, for most interpreters, and for this talk I will exclude audio description and speech-to-text interpreting, but for most interpreters, their task is the same, and it consists of reproducing an utterance formulated by a speaker in one language into another language while keeping the perceived intention and meaning. And I think you all agree with me on that. It's uh, nothing that we usually disagree on. And this task can be performed simultaneously with the original utterance or consecutively, that is in shorter or longer chunks after the original utterance has stopped. Another interesting aspect is that until recently, these different types of interpreters have been studied in research using very different approaches. Uh, but this is, after all, a uh, talk about the cognitive processes in interpreting, so therefore I'm coming back to those. Uh, any cognitive task, of course, that we perform is, uh, as humans is based on countless cognitive, uh, underlying cognitive processes. So the, process I, the processes that I will enumerate today uh, should not be understood as exhaustive, but rather seen as something like the basics of the cognitive processes uh, necessary for interpreting. Oops. And they are not very surprising, perceiving, understanding, remembering, storing, transferring and producing. And our interpreter will perceive an utterance, uh, identify it as legible in their language or understandable in their language. They will understand the meaning, the message, uh, and this is a decoding that will be done by the language areas in the brain. And while they process the utterance, it has to be remembered and stored. And at some point, the utterance has to be transferred to the other language. Uh, some kind of encoding into that language is done. And as a final step of the loop, our interpreter produces the utterance in the other language, which also include, of course, muscle activities and speech activities, which are also processes. The identification of these processes is not very new. It can be traced back to Maida, who in 1964 tr described translation as an activity of uh, identifying, decoding, transferring, and producing a message from one language into the other. These steps in interpreting also, of course, does not happen in a single linear process, but they rather happen as a simultaneous or organic one. And studies uh, on uh, cognitive approaches in interpreting have mainly focused on the process of simultaneous and in some case also consecutive conference interpreters. And examples of area studies, uh, which is, are of course not comprehensive lists, but examples are time lag, working memory, strategies, directionality, gaze patterns and interpreters' uh, expertise. And the example of the studies that I give here is also by no, no means exhaustive. They are just examples. The fact 
that cognitive processes have mainly been studied in conference interrupting has led me, together with Gita Englund Dimitrova, to think about the following question. Ah, sorry about the jumping back and forth. Um, are the cognitive processes different in other types of interrupting? There are many things that may... Oh, there are many things that le may lead you to believe that there is a difference. Because if we just take a moment to compare different training programs for different type of interpreters, we can see that conference interpreter, for instance, on the left-hand side of the slide, has a training which is much more extensive, uh, both if you compare them to sign language interpreter education and to public service interpreter education. Uh, so this difference in training may lead you to ask whether the cognitive demands are different. There are also the fundamentals of the two main interpreting modes to consider uh, before we go further. And I will now only discuss spoken language interpreter, interpreting, sorry, and I will also not consider remote or distance interpreting because there are only so many variables a girl can handle in one presentation. But the fundamentals of simultaneous interpreting, and please challenge me on this, uh, I'd be happy to discuss it. The fundamentals of uh, simultaneous interpreting is that the uh, interpreter's utterances are simultaneous renditions of monologues or longer utterances into another language uh, with little concurrent interaction between the speakers. Uh, the speaker is relatively distant to the interpreter, and the simultaneous interpreter also works into one language for longer periods of time. The interpreter's output follows the speaker's output with very little lag, and the interpreter monitors their own understanding and output. Um, there is much more to simultaneous interpreting, of course, but these are some of the fundamentals that may be interesting in comparison to dialogue interpreting, on the other hand. No, no dialogue interpreting. There we are, dialogue interpreting. <clears throat> dialogue interpreting, on the other hand, uh, there I would argue that the fundamentals are the following. The interpreter's rendition, uh, uh, renditions are a target text of a preceding utterance and a point of departure for the next source text. The interpreter is close to the participant, and the interpreter is also the hub of the interaction, which was something that was pointed out by Birgitta Englund Dimitrova already in 1991. And the fact that the interpreter is close to the participants and the hub of the interaction is also often a starting point or a result of a lot of research in community interpreting. The dialogue interpreter monitors their own comprehension, their output and the output, sorry, their own comprehension and their own output, and they also monitor the participants' uh, contributions to, to the dialogue. The interpreter has an active role in turn-taking, and they may also use turn-taking as a strategy. The, in, the interpreter... The the interpreter ongoingly produces utterances into the two languages of the conversation, and they may therefore also have to deal with asymmetrical language uh, levels of their own language knowledge in the two working languages. And this is an image that Vigita and I came up with a couple of years ago, and that I still come back to when I think about the processes involved in interpreting. We did not at all invent the skills and the knowledge listed here, but rather collected them from different textbooks and research articles on interpreting. I believe that we can agree that the interpreting process is depend dependent on a set of skills and knowledge. I'm not going to dwell on them, but um, necessary sub-skills comprise, but are not limited to, 
listening, comprehension, memory, note-taking, public speaking, speech production, transferring to two languages, sometimes simultaneous, interaction management, like turn-taking or face threats. Oops. Um, like turn-taking or face threats, the attentional capacity management, the nonverbal communication, monitoring of comprehension, production, and other things, and problem solving. And when it comes to supporting knowledge, the language knowledge comprises necessary linguistic competence in at least two languages. Uh, it includes fluency, a wide range, range of vocabulary, the ability to understand and reproduce register variation. And as said, the dialogue interpreter, interpreter requires advanced language competence in two languages. And the ability to work into them both alternate, alternatingly. And in terms of general and specific background knowledge, that, of course, uh, varies a lot depending on the context and on the specialization. And I argue once again uh, that, and I hope you agree with me, that these skills and this knowledge is necessary for all types of interpreting. And the fact that it jumps around gives away my uh, line of argument. But here we are. Uh, that if we bring this back to the cognitive processes underlying the interpreting process, uh, they are the same regardless of the type of the interpreting. And I will also argue that working memory and uh, working memory is what, what Badley and Hitch describe as a combination of storage and ongoing processing. And that this working memory and its capacity is as important for simultaneous interpreters as for dialogue interpreters. But that the use of this working memory may look slightly different depending on the type of interpreting. And yet, when we look at research focusing on working memory, there's an overwhelming focus on simultaneous, in simultaneous interpreters and to some extent also sign language interpreters. Now, I'm going to make an argument here about what labels do to interpreters and interpreting research. Because dialogue interpreting, or short consecutive without notes, is the most common mode in public service interpreting or community interpreting. And simultaneous interpreting is the most common mode in conference interpreting. This means that we know a lot about the working memory uh, of conference interpreters, but we don't know so much about the working memory of community or public service interpreters. Admittedly, they could of course be the same person or the same individual, but I think you will agree with me that most often they are not. I'm going to take a short break here with almost at the 20 minutes and um, <clears throat> uh, where was I now? <laughs> Apart from saying that I'm going to take a short break. Uh, yes, uh, and I'm going to take a short break, break before I start talking about the project that I've been running for the past four years together with Birgitta Englund Dimitrova and our PhD student, Alexandra Adler. But I will leave you with the question of whether past research focus may have other impact on the interpreters than only the fact that we know more about working memory of conference interpreters than working memory of public service interpreters. And with this, I come to my break slide. And uh, I don't know what how you want to do this, uh, Nicoletta, but should I just turn off my microphone and give us a five-minute break? Yes, we, sorry, my microphone. Yes, I would just um, leave the slide there and turn off for five minutes and we'll meet you back here. OK. 
Okay, if everyone is ready, we can resume with the second part of the session. Um, I will be taking the questions through the chat and then we'll read them uh, out loud to the speaker once uh, the um, second part of the presentation is finished. And also, if you cannot see the slides, please remember that on Teams you can choose to see either the slides or the speaker by clicking on the slides or the speaker's video feed. So, Professor Tiselius, the floor is yours again. Thank you so much for that. I will have no way of, no possibility of answering all the questions. Thank you so much for all the discussion. Uh, but I'm looking forward to doing it. Uh, I just want to say that I uh, I agree with the com the. Um, comment that it might be better to see dialogue and simultaneous interrupting as part of the continuum. Uh, what I've done here is today is to separate them uh, so that we can look at them more in um, isolation and compare them to each other. That does not mean that they exist in a con continuum, maybe even in a continuum in uh, one single um, uh, in one single encounter. But back to my uh, presentation. If I can get the slides to work in my way, which I can't clearly. Um, now I'm going to spend some time on my project, which we call the Invisible Process, Cognition and Working Mem Memory of Dialogue Interrupting. It is a, an explorative project aiming to study the cognitive processes of dialogue interrupting. I'm the project leader, and you may have guessed now, if you didn't know me before, that my partner in crime is Birgitta Englund Dimitrova. And as I said earlier, our PhD candidate, Alexandra Adler, is also part of the project. We have other collaborators as well. Thomas Thompson wrote his MA on in the project, and he has since then gone on to an independent PhD project, not within this invisible process, but on related topics. Uh, Kylie Sneed who was absolutely crucial when it comes to date, eye tracking data collection and working memory data collection, and also in the analysis of that. And Heidi Smith-Litke uh, has helped to collect data on emotional intelligence. And I'm sorry to say that we haven't analyzed them yet, so I'll have to come back on that. The project was funded by the Swedish Research Council for a four-year period. You see that we're drawing near the end. We have been extended at least into 2021. Our project home is uh, at the Institute for Interpreting and Translation Studies at the P Department of Swedish Language and Multilingualism at Stockholm University. And our research questions for the whole project, which I will not answer all today, I promise, nor <laughs> I, I'm sorry I cannot, but our research questions are the following. Uh, are there differences in the cognitive processes of experienced professional community interpreters and interpreting students when it comes to central executive functions, for example, attention sharing and switching or resistance to interference? Are there differences in how experienced professional community interpreters and interpreting students cope with cognitive load in general and depending on language directions? And are there differences in the required type-specific monitoring between experienced professional community interpreters and interpreting students? And our results, oops, and our results will be compared to other types of interpreting, but then based on published results from other studies. We have not, in our study, uh, studied other types of interpreting. Um, these are, oh, sorry. These are uh, the methods and data that we have collected. Uh, we administered a background questionnaire to our participants about education, language learning, and language use. We had participants take a dialing test for Swedish and their other language. And if you don't know dialing, it's a computer-based 
diagnostic test, which uh, has been developed by 25 different European universities and other institutions. And the aim is to assess any candidate's language competence according to the Council of Europe's CFER levels. It's a diagnostic test, I have to stress that. We also gave them a RAVEN test for general intelligence. Uh, we had them perform a scripted role play uh, into which we had inserted witch points, uh, the PACTA, the typical witch points. The role play was recorded using two video cameras and eye tracking glasses on the interpreters, on the interpreter. And the interpreters did retrospection immediately after the role play. The mesquite is the test of emotional intelligence, which they took. And the working memory tests were two back, letter span, operation span, barouillet, and matrix and arrow flanker. Oh. I have no idea why this is jumping. I'm so sorry about that. Anyway, a total of 17 interpreters participated in our project. I realized that for some language populations, this is very small. For us, it's a big project. We covered the languages of French, Spanish, and Polish, and Swedish, of course. And we initially went for French and Spanish because Birgitta and I mastered them. And thanks to Alexandra, we also added Polish when she was recruited into the project. We had a total of 10 inexperienced and student participants, and they had, as you can see, a little heterogeneous background, which also reflect the heterogeneous flora of uh, training programs in Sweden. A few of them came from our own university program, a few from a military interpreting program, and finally, a few from a so-called folk high school training program which is a post-secondary non-university education system, which is typical for Northern Europe. The Polish inexperienced participants had started working, but they had not been working uh, more, but they had been working less than a year, sorry. And our experienced interpreters uh, had either university or folk high school education and interpreting, and they had passed the Swedish state authorization test. Uh, which is a test of both background knowledge and practical interpreting. And they also had at least five years of experience. Uh, today, I will not go further into data analysis in this presentation because I simply don't have the time to do that. But I will present our findings this far. And these findings have been reported in different articles and presentations, so I encourage you to read the articles if you're interested in knowing more about the analysis we did. And there's still a lot of material which has not been analyzed yet. So, for instance, I will not be reporting on any of the working memory tests, which I'm sorry for since I focus so much on uh, working memory. But we will come back to that, as you shall see. And I will not either report on the mesquite test, which I'm very curious to know more about as well. But we have found some interesting things. And about determining language proficiency, uh, we found that we struggled with the dialang as an assessment tool. So the first thing we did was to look further into uh, that uh, assessment. And we compare the dialing assessment versus the participant's self-report of their strongest language. We looked at five students and six experienced interpreters with uh, French and Spanish. The main reason for this was that Polish was unfortunately not part of the dialing test, so our Polish participants could only do the Swedish part of the dialing. Interestingly, there was a discrepancy between the perceived strongest language and the dialing assessment for one of the students and for five of the pro professionals. Dialing assessed all participants to have either Swedish as their strongest language or for them being bilingual, or sorry, for being ba balanced bilinguals, I mean. And, th and they clearly did not perceive this themselves. Uh, about the impact 
uh, of language proficiency. This was what uh, Thomas Thompson did his MA in. He used the data from the project and he looked at the, our Spanish participants and again their DLN results and also the participants' assessment of their own assessment of the language. He also looked at strategy use in the rich points. His study partly replicated Arumi Ribas and the Vargas Urpi study, which was reported in Interpreting in 2017. And he found that when the, the participants interpreted into the language they considered their weaker language, they used more interpreting strategies than when they interpreted into the language they considered their stronger language. And this was the same for inexperienced and experienced interpreters, but compared between the groups, the experienced interpreters used less strategies overall. Then we looked at gaze patterns in dialogue interpreting, and this study comprised all the participants in the project. And here we found that gaze patterns differed depending on the type of action. And the type of action is then whether the interpreter was listening or speaking. And it also differed depending on language direction. Mm. Gazing at the speaker was more common when interpreting into the client's language than when interpreting into Swedish. And, uh, when, um, and when participants were interpreting into the client's language, they averted gaze more. And experienced interpreters averted their gaze more in all conditions although that finding was not statistically significant. <clears throat> and again, without statistic, statistical significance, we also found that inexperienced participants gazed more at the client's face. The fact that there was a difference in the gaze pattern depending on language direction for the participants as a group may again indicate a greater cognitive load when preparing to work into a perceived weaker language. So, then we have also uh, looked at turn-taking and the use of turn-taking to handle cognitive constraints. And um, this study comprised eight participants uh, with French and Spanish, two experienced and two inexperienced interpreters, respectively. And we assumed that the experienced interpreters would be better at managing their cognitive load and this meant then that we expected that they would both be able to break up the terms if necessary, but also that they would be able to interpret in longer terms. And we found that in the first part of this, that was that they would be able to interpret the rich points we inserted in the role play faster. That was statistically confirmed. And this, so uh, the experienced interpreters were faster interpreting the rich points. And the second part, namely that the coupled turns and the coupled turns, that is the original utterance and the interpreted utterance. So not in the role play, but an utterance uttered in Swedish and it's interpreting into uh, the other language. So this coupled turn, that, that would be longer for inexperienced interpreters in the rich points, was not confirmed. In fact, the coupled turns had similar length, regardless of experience. And finally, that our experienced interpreters, they had fewer <clears throat> renditions, uh, meaning Sorry, but I'm reading here. Our experienced interpreters had fewer reduced renditions, I mean. Uh, this means that they, the experienced interpreters, rendered the information more accurately than the inexperienced interpreters, but only when but only significant when interpreting into Swedish. And the fact that the length of the coupled turn did not differ depending uh, between the participants may indicate 
what we call a limit in their processing span. So meaning that there is a limit in the interpreter's processing capacity, a little bit similar to what ear voice span can tell us about simultaneous interpreting. As I said before, I cannot uh, answer our research questions here. I think we simply haven't analyzed the material uh, yet, all of the material. But I will uh, at least uh, give some temp tentatives, ideas, or conclusions. And the tentative conclusions are that uh, the perceived or the actual language, language proficiency may impact the dialogue interpreter's process, and the cognitive load may impact the dialogue interpreter's process. And also, and perhaps most interesting, and uh, is that there may be a, a universal cognitive constraint of the dialogue interpreter's working memory. Uh, and this is then the fact that the couple turn, that we didn't see a difference in the length of the couple turn between experienced and inexperienced. So, having said all that, and coming back to what is, what's in a name, I would argue that the fact that simultaneous interpreting has been studied from a cognitive perspective since the first studies in the field has had an impact on how we perceive the different types of interpreting. The concurrent listening and production in simultaneous interpreting and its impact on the working memory has intrigued researchers, and that is very understandable and, of course, very fine. But what I hope that I have shown so far with my presentation and with this project is that by not looking at the cognitive processes of the dialogue interpreter, one overlooks important aspects of the working memory of all interpreters. And that risks, in turn, to contribute to uh, an underlying assumption that dialogue interpreting would be cognitively less challenging that than other types of interpreting. And I argue, of course, that it is not less, less cognitively challenging. So if I come back to the issue of whether past research focus may have other impact on the interpreters than only the fact that we know more about working memory of conference interpreters than that of public service interpreting, so on that question, I am inclined to answer that, yes, it has a lot of impact on that. And with that, I say thank you so much. I'm looking forward to discuss this with you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would now move on to the questions and answer session. I see applauses coming, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I tried to, there's been quite a lot of debate going on in the chat, so I, I will try and pick out the, the questions that still need to be uh, answered, but please, if I miss any of them, because there's a lot of uh, chat going on, please do help me by sending them again on the chat. Uh, so the first question I have is by Jonathan Downey, who is asking, how should we understand the effects of back-channeling, nodding, or other signs of comprehension, or the lack of it in simultaneous interpreting? Do we know anything about how interpreters process such signs? Well, I don't, uh, because I have not looked at it, quite simply. But um, I, I do not argue that there is no co-construction in simultaneous interpreting. And I do not argue that simultaneous interpreting could not be researched from a dialogic perspective. That is the co-construction of meaning. Uh, but what the idea here was that, as I said, that I wanted to um, compare dialogue and simultaneous interpreting uh, to each other. And therefore, I may have stressed some points stronger than they necessarily are. Or I may have tried to stress what it what is more specific of one 
uh, interpreting mode and the other. And so I also saw somebody write in the chat that we sh that um, this is um, the fact about longer or short consecutive. And what I mean with dialogue interpreting is this very short consecutive without notes. So the fact that you interpret uh, an utterance after the other. And obviously dialogue interpreters can take notes as well, but I'm not after this type of longer uh, consecutive interpreting when I look into this. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I can move, can I move on to the next question or, yeah, okay. Um, so we have a question by Anna Isabelle Allobato. Uh, what role do culture and ideology play from a cognition point of view? And are these factors considered part of supporting knowledge and general or background knowledge? Yeah, uh, I don't think that we know enough about the roles that they play in cognition, at least not in cognition, in interpreting. So uh, uh, when Anna has finished her PhD on cultural aspects of simultaneous interpreting, she may want to look into how cognition and uh, cultural background uh, has impact on each other. Thank you. Uh, next question again by Jonathan Downey. How are our distinctions between modes and settings as empirically, empirically sorry, justified? Are they more political than scientific or something else? Mm. Um, I don't know. I'm struggling with what it has actually been, um, how the definition of different modes are made and how the different definition of different interpreting professions is made. And uh, maybe, you know, it's driven by the users or it's driven by other factors uh, than the interpreting researcher or even the interpreter themselves. Uh, so I'm not sure that there's a big political uh, agenda behind whether we call it simultaneous or dialogue interpreting. Uh, but definitely the name affects uh, how, how you see it and what you think about it. Thank you. Then a question from Serena Ghiselli, who is asking, how did you choose the tests to include in your battery? Uh, the working memory test, I wanted to, because this is what we want to compare to the simultaneous interpreting. So these are basically the tests that Chaka Timarova used in her PhD study uh, on simultaneous interpreters. So in order to have comparable data sets, uh, we choose the same uh, working memory um, uh, tests. And for, um, what was that? Yeah, yeah, I think I stopped there. Okay, then another question on the tests by Tim Slater. Did you compare this with other assessment tests? And if not, why not? Uh, we did not compare uh, Dialang and their own assessment with other assessment tests simply because we did not have our uh, participants do any other assessment tests. Uh, but I think that the assessment of language knowledge in inter You have your microphone muted. Um, I don't know what's happened, but it's suddenly. I'm sorry. It's on now. Yeah. So uh, what I said was that no, we didn't compare them to other language assessment tests simply because we hadn't, we didn't have them do any other language assessment tests. But I think that language assessment in interpreting uh, is a big area that needs a lot more research. Um, we have another question on Dialang by Cristiana Cervini. Uh, she asks, which parts of the test you propose to the participants? Because she says, if I remember well, there are five or six abilities or components. Yeah. And now I have to say the right ones uh, without... <laughs> because if, if you have them do all the five or six ones, it takes a very long time. So obviously... We choose because we didn't, uh, we couldn't ask more time of our participants. Well, that's not obviously, but that was a choice we made. So we had them do the listening comprehension, 
and we had them do uh, the reading comprehension, I think. Uh, and now you may ask, why reading? Well, there wasn't any speaking, so we couldn't do the speaking one. Um, and uh, in the reading, there is, I think we chose that one because there is the implicit message uh, that you need to understand in dialogue. And we thought that that was also something that may be, uh, I don't know, predictive of uh, language skill necessary for interpreters. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question on notes by Rachel Herring. She asks if you exclude all taking of notes uh, in the study and the participants, and what about writing down a number or a name versus the classic uh, consecutive note taking? Yeah. Uh, well, clearly, writing down a number and a name, if you look at what interpreters do in a dialogue meeting, that's the type of notes that they would take. Uh, because we had eye tracking glasses on our interpreters, we asked them not to take notes. And you may argue that this is a very unecological way of doing it. Uh, it might be, but we also know a lot of through anecdotal stories from a lot of our interpreting students that many of them do not use notes in these type of um, dialogue meetings. Um, so may or may not have been uh, an ecological challenge. Uh, but also because we wanted to push their working memory, uh, we thought that not taking notes is a good idea. So two things, uh, because we didn't want to lose eyes. Uh, and if you have a lot of uh, writing um, in a notebook looking below your eye tracking glasses, you lose the signal of the eyes. Uh, so that was one Sorry, important... what did you mean by ecological? You just said several times ecological, and I didn't understand what you meant by that in this context. With ecological in this context, I meant that we wanted to create, although we had a scripted role play, we wanted to create a situation as similar to a, a dialogue interpreting situation as possible. So we had a meeting room which looked like an office. We had actors acting uh, a newly arrived immigrant and an employment officer. And we had a dialogue which the actors had learned and they were also encouraged to follow the interpreter. So not going on to the next line, but rather follow the interpreter through uh, the dialogue. And we did that because we wanted comparable sets. So we wanted these rich points interpreted so that we could compare the interpretings to each other but we also wanted the interpreters to feel that this is a situation that I could have interpreted in. And they also commented on the fact in the retrospections that it felt real. Um, and so this is what I mean with ecological. But then one thing that we took out, which would have been real, was to allow them to have pen and paper, because that's what you usually have in an interpreting situation. So we didn't allow them to have pen and paper, uh, first, because we didn't want to lose eye tracking data, and second, uh, because we uh, wanted to challenge their uh, working memory. Now, you may also ask whether uh, having eye tracking glasses is a challenge to the ecological validity or not. Uh, but most of them said that they forgot that they had the glasses on after just a few minutes into the role play. Thank you very much. I think we have a last question, if I'm not mistaken, by Chris Mellinger. Uh, he's asking, in your experience, do training configuration take into account cognitive aspects of interpreting or are these driven more by university requirements of the perceived status or difficulty of the, of the various types of interpreting? I'm sorry, that was so long and I'm so tired and I can't find Chris's question in the chat, so you'll You're have right. to repeat it. I, I can <laughs> both repeat it and copy it again in, on the chat. So. Uh, so I found it in the chat. Thank you. Oh, okay, you have the it. The training can okay. take into account cognitive of interpreting or are they striven for my the perceived status? Mm, that's a really hard question. I think that 
what when we now I look at my own training and I have seen in the in the chat also that people have commented on how I put the training programs beside each other and said that there's different depending on country to country and I know that there's difference and this was not meant as a one size fits all type of return inter, uh, of presentation of interpreting trainings it was meant as an example of different interpreting trainings because I think you can agree with me that typically simultaneous conference interpreter has a longer training uh, on an, a more advanced level and uh, dialogue community interpreters or public service interpreters usually have shorter training uh, without saying that this is true everywhere and for everyone. But, but then coming back to my own experience of training at university level, uh, I think that we demand from our um, conference interpreters during training that they work a lot more on the stamina of their working memory and maybe strategies on how to use their working memory, meaning that we are pushing more on memory exercises or uh, longer consecutives and so on and so forth. And for community interpreters, uh, there's a tendency that we focus so much on ethical aspects or terminology so that we may forget this cognitive aspect of the dialogue. Uh, how, how, do you mas how do you manage the coupled turn? How do you manage turn-taking? How can you use turn-taking as an active tool? Uh, and this is also very generalized, so I'm not saying that this is what everyone does everywhere. But if I can put forward something uh, from a training point of view, that would be that uh, pushing the cognitive limits of uh, public service interpreters and understanding how turn-taking and um, the couple turn works in a dialogue is probably a very good thing to get during training. And also simply the fact that training is uh, the training for public service interpreters normally are shorter and perhaps not even at university. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one more question on notes. Uh, Rachel Herring again is asking if the lack of pen and paper ca came up in the um, retrospections. Uh, no, actually not. One interpreter mentioned in the beginning of the role play to the participants when she did her uh, interpreting introduction. So this type of, I don't know if you have it in your countries, but in Sweden we have this type of interpreting introduction where the interpreter will say that he or she is neutral and impartial and will interpret everything that is said in the room and that the participants should look at each other. And she added and I would like you to not take long turns because I don't have pen and paper, uh, which was not, you know, incited by us or anything. Uh, so we wondered for this interpreter whether that would change the type of um, dialogue that we would have. Uh, but it didn't really. But we could also notice with her that she was, uh, this was an experienced interpreter and that she was clearly steering the turns to be shorter, which I also think was a lack of, of not having pen and paper. But she didn't mention it in the retrospection. So no, I don't, it didn't come up afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are no more questions. Um, so if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, close the event here. Um, so dear Professor Tiselius, uh, thank you very much again uh, for uh, your fascinating lecture. Um, for those of you who are listening, the lecture has been recorded and it will be published on the MC2 uh, website uh, in a month's time, uh, which is also when we will have our next uh, lecture. It will be on the 18th of March, and we will have Lab Associate Professor Anna Rosen Lopez, who will give a talk uh, entitled Not Every Translation is Guided by Logic, Emotions Also Play a Part. So save the date. Thank you very much, and I wish you a nice rest of the day. Thank you.